Welcome to the video lecture on part four of Samuel Taylor Coleridge's The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. And of course part three uh, ended on page 11 of the Dover Thrift edition with the uh, souls of the dead men whizzing past the ancient mariner, uh, reminding him of his crime of killing the albatross with the whiz of his crossbow being reiterated. Uh, it's at this point in the ballad where the wedding guest speaks again and in many ways uh, uh, echoes how uh, readers feel. And we get the voice of him in the first person opening uh, part four. I fear thee, ancient mariner, I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown as is the ribbed sea sand. Uh, and here, so the, the wedding guest functions as the narratee to uh, the mariner's narrator. And it's this extended dialogue, and we're constantly reminded that this is a conversation taking place outside of a church where a wedding is taking place, where the wedding guest is next of kin. Um, but it reminds us that we're perhaps right to fear the ancient mariner. Uh, and indeed, the, the side note is very, very helpful. The wedding guest feareth that a spirit is talking to him, which uh, suggests biological extension, is the ancient mariner a spirit? Remember the first word of the poem is, it is an ancient mariner. So is it a spirit? Is it a zombie? Is it a prophet? A Svengali figure, the wandering Jew, is it a, a messiah, saviour figure? Okay, so spirit could be good or bad, ghost, spectre, wraith, what is it? Okay, um, and his, his physical appearance is commented on by the voice of the wedding guest to characterise him. The skinny hand we've talked about in previous uh, video lectures, but of course, is it a cloven hoof? Is it skeletal appearance? Is it the ravages of age? How long has the mariner been telling this story? For how many centuries? Okay. Um, and thou art long and lank and brown. Okay, so sort of skinny, emaciated, tanned and gnarled from many sea voyages, um, you know, perhaps. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, the eye of possession, um, demonic or otherwise, and thy skinny hand so brown. Okay, again, this, this perhaps, the skin, comparing to the white skin of uh, the nightmare life and death, which was linked to leprosy, here, why, why is the wedding guest so concerned about this? Is it, it's, it's not English, it's not Anglo-Saxon, it's in some way sort of different, um, other, odd, uh, in that respect, sinister, menacing and ominous. Fear not, fear not, you wedding guest, this body drop not down. I didn't die, he's saying. By saying that, he's saying, I'm not a spirit, I'm not a ghost, or I'm immortal. Uh, okay. And again, I, I quite, you could, there is a case for suggesting that the, the mariner's almost being a little bit chipper here, who knows. But the ancient mariner, sure of him, of his bodily life, which is very interesting, a bo alive in body, but uh, not alive in terms of mind and soul and spirit. So he's still able to move around and speak, but where is his soul? Still trapped? Still in, in, in purgatory? Still being judged? In hell? Possibly. And proceeded to relate his horrible penance. Alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea, and never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. So it's interesting, no one took pity is it because he hasn't prayed and asked for pity, or has he been forsaken by God, Christianity, and any other spirituality? Okay, his soul is in agony and no one's taking pity. Uh, Christianity suggests that God's capacity for forgiveness is infinite. Um, presumably one has to ask, and so there is a, that could be considered quite disturbing that he is quite so wretched for one mindless act of indiscretion. This clearly shows how much Coleridge values nature in the natural world. Uh, the many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. So there's still a um, separation between the beauty of mankind and the beauty of nature. It seems to suggest that... Um, Humanity, human civilization is beautiful, and it's a real, it's a real shame. It's a, a, a terrible atrocity that these men have died. But he, at the moment, he doesn't connect that with how the natural world has also suffered. Um, I think Coleridge is always proposing that these things are inseparable, okay, and that they're a crime against any living thing is as of an equal caliber in a hierarchy of sin, okay. Um, the slimy things that are living on, uh, it's interesting because, you know, it, he perceived himself as slimy. And again, that still kind of works as a negative insult if you were to describe someone as sort of slimy, it's sort of sleazy, sordid, 
tainted in some way. And that's certainly how he feels because of his guilt. Um, but then, what are these slimy things? We've seen them crawling on the surface of the ocean in previous parts of the ballad. Um, they, again, seem, seem odd, eccentric, uh, threatening in many respects. And perhaps most damning of all is the side note. He despiseth the creatures of the calm. Well, in a way, it's a ballad about despising creatures. What made him kill the albatross in the, in the first place? Was it hatred, etc., in that, in that way? I looked upon the rotting sea. The sea is rotting along with his sort of his own festering, rancid morality, perhaps, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay, and envy if that they should live and so many lie dead. Uh, and it, perhaps he's going, well, wh why can't I die? Why have I been spared? Why do I have to continue to be suffered, uh, to continue to suffer? I looked to heaven and tried to pray. So here, the logical sequence would be asking for a, a supernatural, omniscient power for salvation. But, or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. Now, who is this? What's this wicked whisper? Well, it's, it's arguable that that is the nightmare life and death who owns his soul. And this kind of this supernatural gothic villain, spiritual villain, who, who has ownership of the mariner's spirit and destiny, will not let him pray, will not allow him to ask God for forgiveness. So there's, there's very much a, a conflict between good and evil in the ownership of the mariner's destiny. He's looking to try and mend his ways and turn to the path of salvation and righteousness, but is forbidden from doing so. Um, this wicked whisper, again, the alliteration there, almost onomatopoeic and saying, you know, you can't pray. And that's as, that's as dark as anything else, isn't it? You know, prayer is the communication with God, but yet something is stopping you doing that. Um, and it makes us think that something's stopping humanity communicating with God throughout uh, Coleridge's culture, which he seems to find entirely disagreeable. Um, I close my lids and kept them close and the balls like pulses beat so we can see that the, the, the dehydration is suffering almost like a sort of migraine behind the sort of throbbing uh, eyeballs here. For the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye and the dead were at my feet. Well here we can see the sky and the sea, stereotypical images of nature, were like a load on my weary eye, were a responsibility on me. So Coleridge is perhaps promoting how we should take a responsibility for the natural world and be responsible for our actions within the natural world. Lay like a load on me, you know, the burden, the responsibility of uh, a human being living in the natural world and the dead were at my feet. Well, literally and figuratively, the dead corpses of the crew are at his feet, but they're at his feet in terms of he is responsible for them, okay? The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they, so they, they're not decomposing, which is slightly uh, alarming, but the curse liveth for him in the eye of the dead men, they look, the look with which they looked on me had never passed away, so dead corpses still giving the ancient mariner evils uh, colloquially, okay, an orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, well this again perhaps works in different ways, on a very simple level, an orphan has been cursed because it has no parents, so uh, you can look at it that way, but there is a lot of sort of legends and myth about the power of, of orphans and stairs, etc. Uh, an orphan's curse would drag to have a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. So perhaps to be, to be looked at by the corpse of a dead man who's blaming you for their death is perhaps worse than being an orphan in the sort of lottery of life. Uh, Seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. So there's, a, there's uh, almost like a plea for annihilation, destruction, uh, an end to it all, because it is so, so harrowing. Okay. That's one of the big debates in the poem. How, how much suffering, how much punishment, how hideous is the poem? Or is it you know, a whimsical, childlike ditty? Um, the moving moon went up the sky and nowhere did abide softly she was going up and a star too beside her beams bemocked the sultry main like april hoarfrost spread 
But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way, a still and awful red. It's interesting that the water's burning red makes us think of hell, the sort of the, the satanic hellfires beneath the ocean, uh, which is worth considering. Um, and the idea that we have offended the natural order of things, we have enraged the planet uh, somehow by our actions. Uh, the side note here is very, very expressive. I'm on the top of page 13. In his loneliness and fixedness, he yearneth towards the journeying moon and the stars that still sojourn, yet still move onward, and everywhere the blue sky belongs to them, and is their appointed rest in their native country and their own natural homes, where they enter unannounced as lords that are certainly expected, and yet there's a silent joy at their arrival. Now, I could talk about this a little bit more uh, at some other point, but what we're suggesting here is that the, the blue sky belongs to them. I think that's the bit to perhaps that's most easily seized upon, that the natural world is, is bounteous and it is a paradise for us to be rejoiced, but it comes with great responsibility for your actions within this, uh, within this playground, this cornucopia. Okay. Beyond the shadow of the ship, I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white. So the imagery here, um, we've got the the April hoarfrost. Uh, you know, it's almost uh, the the moonlight appears like frost. The the light at, at times is angelic and satanic, perhaps suggesting good and evil and the pathways and the moral choices that individuals make. Um, they moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flame. It's a subversion, really, of the stereotypical connotations of white light. Um, white imagery is often linked to goodness and purity and chastity, particularly in, in Christianity. And likewise, darkness and, and blackness is linked to evil. And uh, it's this type of symbolism that we call Manichian imagery. And that is being used here, but it's being perhaps adapted a little bit more to be otherworldly in terms of fantasy because of the mention of elfish light. Okay, so we've got, it's perhaps, it's phantasmagorical. It's this blend of fantasy and reality. Okay, and it's perhaps... Um, I wouldn't say necessarily hallucinogenic, but it's certainly colourful here, and it does create a very vivid, uh, colourful sense of scene and place. Um, within the shadow of the ship, I watched their rich attire, blue, glossy green and velvet black. They coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. So the water snakes the, on the surface of the ocean are, are, are the mariners transfixed by them. They are, they're beautiful, and he's rejoicing that such wonderful human, uh, that such wonderful natural things exist. Then he is privileged to see them. And then, again, their beauty and their happiness is almost uh, uh, solace to him in his suffering. Oh, happy living things, he says. No tongue their beauty might declare. So they're, they're, they're so beautiful. In a way, you know, he's made to feel sort of insignificant in the face of such uh, awe-inspiring natural beauty and this touches upon the, the gothic idea of the sublime in many ways um, a spring of love gushed from my heart and I blessed them unaware sure my kind saint took pity on me and I blessed them unaware he blessed them in his heart I don't think it's this sort of twee is simply looking at the water snakes and saying ah oh, bless like they're, they're cute or, or something it's more a, uh, a respect really of how beautiful and uh, how you can become awestruck of the natural world and, and uh, its colours, its variety, its diversity, its, its power in many respects. And it's at that moment, the self-same moment I could pray and from my neck so free, the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. And it's at that moment that the weight of responsibility is lifted from uh, the mariner, literally, and symbolically, so he blesses the water snakes, and suddenly the, the, the albatross is taken from his shoulders. It's interesting that it's when he blesses nature that this happens, okay, um, and not when he asked God. Now that's, or when he tried to pray, now that's possibly because the nightmare life and death is in, is in ownership of his soul, but if you were in any doubt about how nature is revered in the poem, it's the potency which is given to blessing the water snakes at the end of part four, which really intensifies that. Yet again, of course, we end with the albatross falling off and sinking like lead into the sea. Um, so does that suggest that the spell begins to break? It's a suggestion that um, he has suffered some 
And so some of the responsibility for his mindless vandalism and indiscretion and murder uh, has been paid. And it also is perhaps building up to suggest that, well, what will happen now? Okay, everyone on the crew is, the whole crew has died. How is the mariner going to get back home, if at all? Then the smell starts to break. The albatross